We're actually going to read uh, from the Bible today, I think. Yeah. I never do that. You know why? Because I can't see it. So I need these. But I'm actually going to read from the Bible today, I think. And if you read the email, I said, uh, you know, it's that horrible, horrible passage about the Egel Zahav. What does Egel Zahav mean? A uh, No, sort of. A calf. Gold calf. Egel is a calf. Golden calf. Calf. The golden calf. Well, we're going we're gonna to read part of that. We're not going to read that. We're not going to focus on that. But we are going to read part of that passage. This is a lot of information uh, just in the Torah portion itself. There's a long, long, long narrative. <coughs> so <coughs> we're going to focus on one part of it. But in order to understand it, we have to read some of the other stuff, some of the other narrative. So we're in Kitisa, when, when lifted up, translated as when Israel is counted. <coughs> this is one of the terumot. There are three terumot. Do you remember the three terumahs, the three lifted up offerings? This is, this is one of them, the, the half shekel that was used for the bases of the uh, tabernacle. Those 96.3 pound bases in the tabernacle, what came from the half shekels from, that everybody gave? That was one terumah. The other terumah, uh, we're going to hit it next week, which is again the gold, silver, bronze, uh, purple, blue, red, white, linen, etc. All the things that everybody brings. He already told them to do that, right? He's going to do it again next week, next week's Torah portion. So we have an interlude, and we have to find out why there's an interlude. He gave all the mitzvot, he gave all the mishpatim, he gave all the chokim, he gave all the torot, he gave all the uh, instructions for the mishkan, and then bro, we break. So we've got to figure out, why is there a break? In order for it to pick, us, pick up next week with the narrative. So we're in Exodus 32. <coughs> In fact, before we read this, let's, let's, let's go read some of the passage that leads up to this. So I'm going to show you the breakdown of the days of Moses being on the mountain, then on the earth, then on the mountain again. <clears throat> Two of them, uh, one of them ends in our Torah portion, and then one of them is during the Torah portion. And then the next one starts in next week's Torah portion but you have to see what the breakdown is. So we're going to Exodus chapter 32, the Egel Zahav, the golden cat, the golden calf. All right, let's go to, I want you to see the last thing that God gives before Moshe comes down off the mountain. 31, chapter 31, verse 12. It's the Shabbat. This is the last thing that God says to him before he comes down off the mountain. Uh, As for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, you shall surely observe my Shabbatot. Last thing God says, and he lays out the Shabbat, what it is, and he says, okay, all done. I gave you 200 and some mishpatim, and then a bunch of uh, chokim and torot. Here. Here's the ten words, and he gives it to him, and he comes down off the mountain. Chapter 32, when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mountain. Now what the rabbis say is that they made a calculation. And they said, well, he's going to be gone so much time. And they were off by six hours. And so because of that six hour, now there's reason in the Hebrew for that. I'm not going to go into it, but this is what uh, the story says from the Hebrew. That they made a miscalculation of six hours. And they got impatient, and then they said, okay, let's come up with another way. And they came up with the Egel Zahav, the golden calf. The people saw that Moshe delayed to come down, and the people assembled around Aharon and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. Let's go down to verse uh, 7. The Lord spoke to Moshe, go down immediately, because your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt. So now God's putting it on Moshe. Moshe, you're the one who brought him up, and now you're your people, etc. Um, 
have corrupted themselves. They've quickly turned aside from the derech, which I, which I set up for them. The derech. They've made for themselves a molten calf, a, a, a egel zahav, and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it. Verse 11. Then Moshe entreated the Lord his God. Why does your anger burn against your people whom you brought out from the land of Egypt with great power? <clears throat> Sorry, I missed a, an emphasis. Your people that you brought out, Moshe counters. God tells Moshe, your people whom you, are br you brought out. So Moshe turns it back on him and says, no, they're your people who you brought out. You're the one who said you're going to bring them out. You and only you. No angel, no seraph, no, right? Right? You yourself. So he turns it back on him. And he says, um, 12, why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent? That's why he brought them up to kill them. Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people, Israel. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 14, so the Lord changed his heart about the harm that he said he would do to his people. And Moshe turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. He gets down there, and all hell breaks loose. Now, I don't know if you know the story, but he says, everybody strap your sword on your thigh and go through the entire camp and kill everybody who did this. Only one group of people did it. Who were they? Levites. Very good, the Levites, Levi. They were the only ones who did it. <clears throat> And so because they did that, later on, God blessed them, and they were also brought into the tabernacle to help the priests. So they went through and they slaughtered about 3,000 people, and then they ground, they burnt the, the, the calf, and they threw it in the river. What river? What river? Yes, we know there was one. It, it, there, there was a river right there at the foot of Mount Sinai. You can still see the wash. There's a huge arroyo right at the base of the mountain of Mount Sinai where there was a river. <clears throat> you didn't know that there was a river there? There was a river there. So, it's bad. It's horrible. This is like, story's over. Now, how long was he on the mountain? How long was he on the mountain? 40 days. <clears throat> and 40, just 40 days later, done. We lose. So unless something major catastrophic happens, it's over for the Jewish people, basically. Even if he takes them to Israel, it's over. Okay. This is the worst thing that ever happened in the history of Israel. Okay, now we're going to pick it up in Exodus 32. On the next day, Moshe said to the people, you've committed a great sin, and now I'm going up to Jehovah. <clears throat> Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Thing is, he doesn't go up. And that's what, that's what I'm going to show you. He does not go up. He, he goes up to heaven, but he doesn't go up the mountain. So don't get thrown by it saying, I'm going to go up to Jehovah. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moshe returned to Jehovah and said, please... Now, the word for please is na, na, like hoshia na, hatzlicha na, please save, please prosper, hoshia na, hatzlicha na, na means please. Na, this people has committed a great sin, and they've made a god of gold for themselves, but now, if you will it, forgive their sin, but if not, please wipe me out from your book that you've written. However, Jehovah said, go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, on the day that I visit, I will visit them for their sin. Then Jehovah spoke to Moshe. Get up, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt. Now he tells him, I mean, he's in the middle of hawking and spitting and praying and freaking out and saying, oh God, don't kill all of, you know, two million people. And God says, get up and go take them to Israel. Does he go and take them to Israel? No. no. So obviously something's going to happen. Something's going on here. Something's weird. 
But that's what God says. Get up, go take them to the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll send an angel before you. Uh-oh. Is that good or bad? Go either way. <clears throat> Could go either way. This is horrible. Because the whole point of them coming out of Egypt was, like I said, I am not an angel. I am not a seraph, right? I will deliver my people by myself, by myself, right? Now he says, okay, you know what? I'm not doing it anymore. I'll send an angel for you, an, an, uh, an emissary, and, and he can do it. So basically he's saying, I'm done with the Jewish people. That's what God is saying. That's why this is such a big deal. And if you don't believe me, go read what the rabbis say. That's what they say. God is done with the Jewish people. And so Moshe starts hocking and spitting and praying. And he's freaking out. To a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. You see? He's done. He's done. And he says, I'm not going up with you Jews. I'm done with you. Because you're an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the derech. Now we're in 3311. We're, we're skipping some of the story. So the Lord used to speak to Moshe face to face. Panim el panim. Just as a man speaks to his friend. Then Moshe said to Yehovah, You've said, I have known you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Now then, if I have found grace in your sight, please let me know your ways so I can know you. Really? This is Moshe talking? There's a lot of problems with this passage. This is Moshe who just finished 40 days face to face with God in heaven seeing all the miracles of the universe and how God does everything and answering everything that's in the Torah. And now he says, show me your ways so I can know you. If he doesn't know God's ways, nobody does, right? And if he doesn't know God, nobody does. So there's, there's some weird things going on in this passage. It doesn't make sense. You said, God, God, you said, I've known you by name. You knew me, Moses, by name. And you've also found grace in my sight. So if I have found grace in your sight, please not let me know your ways so that I may know you in order that I may find grace in your sight. I already thought you just said, I found grace in your sight. This is rife with contradictions. He just said, you said I found grace in your sight. Oh Lord, please let me have grace in your sight. You see what I'm saying? He keeps contradicting himself, saying things that are opposite from, from what he knows to be true. Well, there's a lot to work out here. In order you may find grace in it. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, all right, my presence will go. And I will give you menucha, rest. All right, so he got him to come down off one thing. Now, here's the thing. You read this passage and it's kind of sedate and it's a few statements. This took 40 days. This argument, this prayer, this pleading, it took 40 days. Now there's another passage, another uh, Torah portion later on in Deuteronomy called the Et Hanan, which means and he graced. And it's about this right here. And it was, was 522 prayers that he prayed. And it took 40 days. So he's, he's on the earth here, and I'll show you this. He's on the earth, and he's praying for 40 days. And it's not just one prayer. It's on and on and on and on. So by the time we get to, um, let's see, my, and he said, my presence will go with you. He's gotten God to back off one of his threats. So that's a good thing. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, uh, if you're, <laughs> I will give you menachah. Then he said to him, if your presence doesn't go, don't even lead us up from here. I thought he just said he would go. Another contradiction. You see what I'm saying? This thing is rife with contradictions. He just said, okay, I'll go. I back down. I'm going to go with you. Look, if you don't go, 
What kind of response is that? It's strange. <laughs> right, it's his feminine side. My presence will, will go with you and I will give you rest. Okay, if your presence doesn't go, don't lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I found grace in your sight? You already said that he, you found grace in God's sight. He says it again. I and your people. Is it not by you going with us so that I and our people may be distinguished from all the peoples on the earth? That's the only thing that makes Jews different from everybody on the planet. And nobody knows it. It's that God is with the Jews, period. But the only reason he's with us is because Moses did this. And he fought for us for 40 days. It's the only reason. So he says, is it not by your going with us so that I and your people may be distinguished from, and now the word is niflinu, which we'll talk about, from all the people on the face of the earth. All the people on the face of the earth. All Christians. All Muslims. All Buddhists. All everybody. The only thing that is different about the Jew is that God is with us. Because of what Moses did. Jehovah said to Moshe, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I have known you by name. <coughs> you think Moshe is done? No. <coughs> now, Moshe, who has just spent 40 days on the mountain, enveloped by the glory of God, says this stupid statement, show me your glory. He just spent 40 days in it, just, just buried in it, living in it, feeling it, absorbing it. And then he says, show me your glory. So this confuses rabbis. This is like, I really don't know what he's asking. I mean, this guy lived in the glory of God. He would take the, ta the, the tabernacle once they built it, and he would always put it outside the, the camp, and then he'd walk through the middle of the camp, and everybody would rise up and bow as he walked through like a king, and then he'd go way out there, and he just enveloped in the glory of God, in the fire, in the smoke of God. And this is the guy that says, show me your glory. So this is very strange. It's not, the reason I'm doing this is because all you have to do is go on the internet and type in, show me your glory. And you're gonna find hundreds and hundreds of Christian teachings where everybody says, oh, show me your glory, show me your glory, show me your glory. But nobody ever says about Moses. He was the only one who actually saw it and felt it and experienced it, and he's the one who says, show me your glory. Yeah, it's like he's got amnesia, or he just like willingly forgot, or, He's an, he's an addict, and he needs a fix. And I think that's what it is. He's like, you know, I, did, I got 40 days, but now I've been 40 days here on the earth with all this nonsense and this stupidity. I need it more. I need it again. I need a fix, man. I'm going down. You ruined me. Yeah, exactly. You ruined me. I need it. I need it. And I think that's what it is. Because nothing else really makes sense. He's the only one who experienced it. <coughs> there were two others. We're not two of them yet. It's in the book of Levit Leviticus. There's two others who experienced the glory of God. Anybody know who they are? Elijah. No? No, it's in the book of Leviticus. Nobody? Close. His kids. No. No, in the book of Leviticus. Yeah. Nadav and Avihu. And they got burned up. They experienced the glory of God, but they got burned up from the inside. Because they did wrong. But that's what Moshe wants to see, the glory of God. So he says, Har eni na kvodecha. Kvodecha. Say kvodecha. Kvod means glory, but it also means honor or respect. So show me your respect. Show me your glory. Show me your honor. <clears throat> and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yehovah. And he said, You can't see my face, for no man can see me and live. Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and while my glory is passing by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. 
Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And this is rife with problems. This last two sentences is crazy talk. But people read it as if it's normal. It is not normal. It's weird, which we'll talk about. Okay, so let's talk about the three times. 40 days up on the mountain, 40 days on earth, 40 days back up on the mountain. So at the end of our passage right here, he has just ended the time on earth, 40 days on earth, praying and hocking and spitting and begging. And then next week is going to be uh, when God passes by him. And, or it might be in this Torah portion. Right? Actually, I think it's in this Torah portion. That God passes by him and, and he proclaims the name of the Lord. Yeah, it's this Torah portion. We're not going to read that. Because that is in the third uh, uh, set of three. Of, sorry, third set of 40 days. That's back up on the mountain. We're going to talk about what happens on earth today. That's what we're about. All right, so the first one, I, I did the best I could do to come up with an illustration of Moses on the mountain. He's seeing the glory of God and seeing the kingdom and seeing heaven. So I did the best I could do, but that's what this is. He's up on the mountain and he's experiencing all the things that are real, all of reality, the real things. Heaven, the throne of God, the angels, the, the kavod, the glory, all that stuff. So this happens at, um, it begins at Shavuot, Exodus chapter 19. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on that very day. Now when it says on that very day, that means third day. Because it says it was the third month on the same day. What same day? Third day. So third month, third day, they came. They, Israel camped in front of the mountain as one man. And then uh, God says, go to the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's the fourth and the fifth. For the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai on the third day. That's Sivan 6. So Exodus 24, 18 says Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. All right, that's the first set of 40 days up on the mountain. Now he comes down, as we just read, <coughs> Exodus 24, 18. Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So let's count the days. <coughs> Sivan 6. Plus 30 days is, the next month is Tammuz, Tammuz 6, plus 10 days, Tammuz 16. Then he comes down, they do all the killing and the burying and the hocking and spitting and everything they did, and then it's the next day. So Tammuz 17 brings us to Tammuz 17. Tammuz 17 is a horrible day on the Jewish calendar. A bunch of bad stuff happened. One other thing, first thing that happened was Moshe came down off the mountain with the two tablets and shattered them. <coughs> Exodus uh, 32. Moshe turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. What, was the, what were the tablets made of? Sapphire. Sap sapphire or lapis lazuli. One of the two. Probably lapis lazuli. So, that's Tammuz 17. Now begins another 40 days on earth. So there's what I told you about, that Moshe would set up the tabernacle. Now there is no tabernacle yet. So where is he going? Out to his tent. Yeah, I guess. His tent. Or maybe he set up a tent for God to dwell with him there, like David did. That's another story. Deuteronomy 9, and he says, I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. I didn't eat bread, I didn't drink water, because of all the sin that you committed in doing what was evil in the sight of Yehovah to provoke him to anger. Now this is on earth. <coughs> Tammuz 18, the next day, starts, plus 30 days, takes us to Av 18, in the middle of summer. 
plus 10 days takes us to Av 28. Now, Av is always a short month. And so the 29th would be the last day of Av. So the next day, 29th of Av, and it takes them to the end of Av. What's the next day in the Jewish calendar after the uh, last day of Av? A little one. Very good. A little one. So now on a little one is going to start the third set of 40 days. He has now gone 80 days with no bread and no water. So what kept him alive? I mean, I'm stupid. I would think the glory of God. And yet he says, show me your glory. Why? If, if he's already experienced the glory of God that's kept him alive for 80 days, and he says, show me your glory, it's got to mean something other than what we think it is. Does that make sense? It cannot be what people think it is. It can't be. Because he, of all people on the planet, has experienced the glory of God. And it kept him alive. So something is kind of screwy here. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah? yeah sure. Now, if you read the Bible without asking these questions, you're not reading the Bible. You're just, you're just looking at words, but you're not reading it. There's a lot of problems here. All right, now comes the third one. <clears throat> Exodus 34, be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. All right, so, so now the next day, a little one, God tells him, come back up to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. <coughs> Exodus 34, 28. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat bread. He didn't drink water. That's 120 days without food or water, enveloped, encased, engrossed in the glory of God. He was like an angel. Yes, like on Yom Kippur, we don't eat, we don't drink, we don't go to the bathroom. It's like being an angel. Well, he did that for 120 days. And yes, he was like an angel. Why? Because he was in heaven. So then why would he say, show me your glory? Yeah, he needs a fix. <clears throat> but also, don't, don't miss this. That it's got to mean something other than we think. It has to. Or else this makes no sense. Because he's already experienced it. Over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. So now, we got 40 days from Elul 1. Elul 1 plus 30 days takes us to Rosh Hashanah. Tishri 1 plus 10 days takes us to Yom Kippur. So this ends his 120 days of not eating and drinking. And praying and being in God's presence. 120 days. No human being could possibly do this. M Moshe, you may not even think about this, but Moshe was the greatest person who ever lived. And if you don't know that, <coughs> you're thinking about Christ. No, I mean, really. I mean, not just, Jews do this too. Jews don't think Moses was the greatest human being who ever lived, the most miraculous human being who ever lived. They, because of our training in America, everybody's head immediately goes to Jesus. He walked on water. He did this. He did that. He did all these miracles. Truth is, nothing compared to Moshe. Nothing. Yeshua went 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the wilderness. Everybody hocks and spits. Oh, oh, Jesus went 40. Moshe went three times that long. So something is kind of screwy here. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Why would he say that? All right. Now, let's start picking apart the passage. Let's see what we can find. First of all, God is non-corporeal, which does away with Jesus being God. Right? Corporeal means cuerpo, cuerpo, body. No body. Bus, well, in, in, think in Spanish. Corporeal. Cuerpo. Cuerpo. No body. So, <clears throat> I'm going to say this again. 
because out there in video land, people are freaking out. If God has no body, Yeshua can not be God. Now it says in Romans chapter 1 that after his resurrection, he was shown to be God. Simple. While he was on earth, he wasn't God. He was a dude. He went to the bathroom. God don't go to the bathroom. So before everything, <clears throat> one of the, by the way, there's many manifestations of God. There's the Ruach HaKodesh. There's, there's the Shekhinah, the glory, the fire. There's the sun, Yeshua, which is called the Memra, which means the, the word that's like part of, that is God. The word that is God, God that is the word, that's called the Memra in uh, Judaism. There's a lot of manifestations of God. Yeshua was one of them, okay? No big deal. But while he was on earth, he absolutely was not God because God is non-corporeal, no body. However, in the passage that we read, it says, I know Moses face to face. How's that possible if God doesn't have a face? Right? Yeah, you could say, okay, it's allegorical. Then he says, he cannot see my face. Then he says, no man can see me physically and live. Well, if he's got no body, how are you going to see him? There's a lot of problems here. And then he says, there's a place by me. Now, in, in Judaism, it's taught that God, he doesn't have a space. He's everywhere, yes. Like we say at the end of the service, Ein od milvado, there's nothing else but him. He's everything. He's in everything. But it's more than that. That he doesn't take up any physical space. And so anything that you say, that ta like God is sitting on his throne, that's stupid. Because he can't sit, because he doesn't have a body, and there's no throne because that's a space. Yes? So everything about this sort of thing is, not, I don't like the word allegorical, it's, pic, it's pictorial, it's metaphor. Everything's metaphor, everything. But he says, there's a place by me, so it's got to be something else. Then he says, I'll take my hand away. So what, God has a hand? Dwell in the wings of God. God has wings, he's a bird. And then he says, you won't see my face, you'll see my back. God has back? So, he doesn't have a body. So, he doesn't have a hand, he doesn't have a face, he doesn't have a back, he doesn't have wings, he doesn't have any of that stuff. But he does have all that stuff, right? Because it's all pictorial to describe as best we can something about him. And believe it or not, this is going to be my point for the teaching, and it's, I'm going to really try my best to bring it down to this. That is the glory of God. The pictures, the metaphors, that is the glory of God. Now, when he says to him, when God says to Moshe, I'm going to stick you in the cleft of the rock, which is impossible because he can't stick anybody because he doesn't have a hand. I'll stick you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll pass by you, which is impossible because he can't pass by because he doesn't have a body. You won't see my face, which he doesn't have because God doesn't have a face. You'll see my back, which he doesn't have. God doesn't have a back. The word in Hebrew for back is not back. It's after. Acharit. Acharit yamim. What is acharit yamim? What is Acharit Yamim? Yamim is days. Yamim is days after end of days. end of days. The Acharit Yamim is an idiom for the day of the Lord. So, and by the way, I came to this just by reading the passage, and then I saw all these rabbis that said the same thing. That he did, what he showed him was the day of the Lord. The Acharit Yamim. When he says, my back, my after, he means what I'm going to do afterwards, in the latter days. That's what latter days is translated as. Acharit Yamim is translated as latter days. But it means after, the days after. 
And it is the kingdom. That's the glory of God. So the glory of God is two things. And this is what Moshe is asking him to show him. Again, he has been absorbed, enveloped, covered, buried in the glory of God for how long? 120 days. At the point that he asked for it, it's been 80 days. And he says, show me your glory. Even though he's been in the glory for 80 days at this point. So, so, well, it was, he's 80, at the, he's at the age of 80, it's been 80 days, 40 on top of the mountain, 40 on the earth, and now it's at the end of that 40 days when he says this. So now it's been 80 days that he's seen the glory and he says, show me your glory. So I'm telling you, I'm going to show you that what the glory is that he's asking to see is two things. It's the kingdom and it's the pictures. Because remember... Who saw the pictures to build them? He did. Right? And Moshe showed, was shown on the mountain all of the Tavniot, all the pictures, right? And then he had Bezalel build them. But even after seeing them, he says, show me your glory. And that's what the glory is. It's the pictures, the metaphors, which is the only way we can know God. And it is the kingdom. That's what I'm going to show you. So let's talk about the fact that he has no body, non-corporeal. <clears throat> the third of the 13 statements of faith by Maimonides says, I believe with perfect faith that God is non-corporeal. And here's the one that nobody believes, non-describable. And so everybody tries to describe God. <laughs> Jesus is the God man. That's a total contradiction, because God has no body, right? So anytime you start to try to describe God, you are going to make a mistake, I guarantee it, unless you just stick with a picture, a metaphor. That's the best we can do, because God has no body, number one, and number two, you can't describe him, because he is beyond description. But we can describe him in a little teeny tiny model. And that's the glory of God, which I will show you. Since it has been clarified that he does not have a body or corporeal form, it is also clear that none of the functions of the body are appropriate to him. Sitting, walking, standing, running, holding, pushing, pulling. You, you can't say that about God. Why? Because he's got no body. Right? And yet the Bible says that about God. Over and over and over and over and over and over. So what, this is by Maimonides. This is one of the greatest books ever written. <coughs> the Mishnah Torah. And he talks about very clearly about how this works in Judaism. <coughs> neither connection nor separation. Neither place nor measure. Neither ascent nor descent, neither right nor left, neither front or back, which he just said, I'll show you my back. Neither standing nor sitting. He says, I will walk in front of you. That means standing. I saw the Lord seated on the throne. Not sitting. There's no sitting. He is found within. He is not found within time. So that he would possess a beginning, an end, or age. He doesn't change, for there's nothing that can cause him to change. But he changed his mind. Right? Why did he change his mind? Because he didn't change. That was his desire in the beginning. He loves Israel. Everything he does, he loves Israel. So Moshe says all this stuff about his, you know, his favorite kid. And he says, oh, don't kill your favorite kid. Mo God, please be nice to your favorite kid. And God goes, okay. He's my favorite kid. He didn't change. The concept of death is not applicable to him, nor is that of life within the context of a physical life. The concept of foolishness, foolishness is not applicable to him. But either is wisdom in terms of human wisdom. 
Not sleep, not waking, not anger, not laughter, not joy, not sadness, not silence, not speech. Now, all these things that he listed are stuff that he got from guess where? The Bible. All these adjectives and verbs that he said, this doesn't apply to God and this doesn't apply, they're all from the Bible. Sitting, speaking, walking, touching, living, wisdom, all that. It's all from the Bible. He's living a picture, but hasn't been written. No, he, he cannot be described in any way other than a metaphor. Because in reality, none of this stuff applies to him. So the best you can do is a picture, a model, a metaphor. Yes? Yes, God says that in the ten words. He says, when I, sh when I appeared to you, Israel, on Mount Sinai, you never saw a tselem or a damut. You never saw a form or a picture. So don't make any pictures of animals and worship them or, or birds or fish or humans or anything because that's not what you saw. There's no picture like that. All right, so then he says, uh, neither silence or speech and the human understanding of speech are appropriate to describe God. Our sages declared, above, in heaven, there's no sitting, no standing, no separation or connection. In other words, none of this stuff applies to God. But it's the best thing we can do to describe God like this. But know that you are not doing a good job. And that's basically the point of it. Because God doesn't have a body. Now, I know that for you, you're probably sitting there going, yeah, okay, whatever, we know. No, you don't. Because we all have spent our whole life in America. And we immediately connect to the image of Jesus Christ. Immediately. I don't care how far you think you've gotten away from it. You have not. Because it's bombarding us 24-7. They're right here. And it's always there. It's always there. This is our training to think physical. The trick is, and this is what I hope to help you with today. I hope. I hope I can do it. Is to try to change your mind to immediately think Picture, model, a little model, a little picture, but it better be Jewish. If you can do that, you can start walking away in your mind from idolatry. If you can't, you never will. And if you don't think you're an idolater, look, I'm a Jew. I've been a believer 44 years. I'm an idolater. I mean, like idolatry, like, you know, having an image that, wor that I worship. Just like everybody else, because in my mind, I think physically. That's idolatry. That's what I'm going to hope to show you. All right, so he says, Hodeyena et drachecha va'adacha. Let me know your way, and I will know you. Let me know your way, and then I'll know you. Didn't he, isn't he the one who God just spent 40 days on the mountain giving him his way? Right? It was about, you know, 40 days ago that he ended it. But the fact is, he was shown God's way, the Torah. Wasn't he? Then why would he show, you, show me your way? Yes? Nope, nope. He literally means, show me your way. That's what he's saying. That's what he literally means. Was he not just shown God's way? Okay, what are some words for, for the, the word of God that he was shown? Torah. Torah. What else? Mitzvot. Mitzvot. What else? Mishpatim. Good. What else? Chokim. Good. Anything else? The derech. Very good. This is what he was shown and told the details of how to teach it. And then he says, now, oh God, show me your way. So I will know you. I guess I should start from the beginning. Just ask yourself, do you really want to know God? Just, just scrape it down to the beginning. 
Do you really want to know God? Really? Or do you want to, you know, like, I want to know you, but, I mean, come on. You know, I still got my, I got my life, I got my things, I got my interests, I got my, all that sort of thing. But do you really, really want to know God? Because Moshe, the, the greatest human being who ever walked the planet, enveloped with God's glory for 80 days, 120 days at the end of it, said, show me your glory. And he also said, show me your derech, so I can know you. If he didn't know God, nobody knows God. Do you understand what I'm saying? If Moshe didn't know God, there's no hope for any of us. So this is what I believe. I believe that this being said by Moshe is what we're supposed to pray. That all Jews, all Christians, all believers should pray this. Now think about what he's saying. God, you've shown me all of Judaism. Show me your way so I can know you. And I believe that's what everybody should pray. Show me, hold on just a sec. Show me your way, your Judaism, your pictures. Why? So I can know you. The only way to know God, the only way to know God is through Judaism. Maybe. You can know, hold on just a sec. You can know about God. But the only way to know God is to play the rules that He set up. And the rules He created, which I've said over and over again, was Abraham, Gentile, I'm going to teach you how to do the Torah, the mitzvot, the chokim, right? And the mishpatim. Gentile, so you can know me, and I can call you friend. I believe those are the rules of the game. The game, And so that's why he said it. Nobody can know God without seeing his way. And his way is Judaism. So this is like a big giant blanket statement of, you know, like, you shall have no other gods before me. It's like one of those. Big blanket statement. Read it again. Hodieni na. I, I, please show me drachecha, your way, va'adacha, and I will know you. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you really want to know God, you have to do it by the way he does it. And that's by Yahadut, Judaism. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we dealt with that before you came in. <coughs> so, we got to ask this question. Didn't Moshe just spend 40 days receiving God's way, his Torah? So th that's why I'm saying it's a big blanket statement. It's something for everybody. This is not just Moshe. He's saying this for a reason. God, let me know your way so I can know you. You want to know God? Do his way. Exodus 32, 8. God said, we read this. They've quickly turned aside from the derech that I set up for them. Deuteronomy 5. You shall walk entirely in the derech which the Lord your God has established for you so that you may live and that it may be well with you. Now, I know when you read that, you, you immediately go, oh, it's like if you do Judaism, you'll have a blessed life. That's what most people think. Not what it's saying at all. You will live and it will be well with you. You'll know God. Deuteronomy 10, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear <coughs> Yehovah your God and walk in all his derechav. This is plural for uh, derech. But his, possessive, his derechot. 
plural. Derechav. Walk in all the derech. derech. There's obviously more than one, just like there's more than one Torah. <clears throat> Torot. And love him and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. How do you serve the Lord with all your heart and all your soul? The derech. Judaism. They're the same thing. That's why he's saying it. Israel, what does the Lord require of you? Fear Yehovah. Okay, how do I do that? Walk in his derech. Okay, how do I do that? Love him. How do I do that? Serve the Lord with all your heart and all your soul. How do I do that? The mitzvah. The derech. That's how. Joshua 22, be very careful to follow the mitzvot in the Torah, which Moshe, the servant of the Lord, established for you. To love the Lord your God and to walk in... Okay, so how do you love the Lord your God? Keeping the mitzvot. And walk in all his derachav and keep his mitzvot and cling to him. Same story every time. Psalm 16, you will make known to me the derech shelchai, the derech hachai. The, the path, the, the, the derech of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And so you'd think that's what Moshe had because he was in God's presence for 120 days. And yet he's the one who asks, show me your glory. He's the one who asks, show me your way so I can know you. So obviously it's got to be something else. It's got to be more than just emotion. Now, the believers were called the Derech in the first century. I have all the verses that say it. There's six verses in the book of Acts that comes right out and says that the believers are called Haderech. And by the way, it didn't bother the Jewish people in Israel or in Jerusalem that they were called Haderech. You know why? Exactly. They did Judaism. They did the Dedech. So, here's the two bottom lines. Doing the way of God, Yahadut, or Judaism, is how we get to know God. So, if you want to know God, and it's, you know, only you can answer that. That's how you do it. I love this phrase. I've loved this phrase for the last ten years. La da'at et Adonai, to know the Lord. La da'at, to know, to have knowledge, et Adonai. Or la da'at et Yehovah, to know the Lord. So you've got to answer that for yourself if you really want to know God. Or if you want to know about Him. Now, he says in the passage, How can it be mo known that I have found grace in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us? so that I and your people may be distinguished from all the people on the face of the earth. I have this argument with my kids all the time. Eileen and I do. <coughs> we, we bait them. We say, hey, do you think Jews are a race? And they, they get all crazy about it. Ah, no, it's not a race. Because that's what's out there in the world right now. You know, like, is Judaism a race? Are they really a race, Jews? Or are they just a culture, a people? And this, you know, this goes around and around and around and around, but really it's real simple. Jews have God with them. Nobody else does. On the whole planet. Now, if Gentiles come into, through Yeshua, the Jewish body of God, even though they don't know it, God will be with them once in a while. Once in a while. But the only people that God ever said, I will be with you, I'm going to go with you, I'm there, I'm stuck with you, is, is Israel. And that's why Moshe was freaking out. Remember I said, uh, Moshe's like, well, God says, I'm not, you know, I'll just send a messenger, I'll send a messenger for you guys. He'll, he'll take you up to Israel. No, no, God, you have to go with us. How's anybody going to know that we're different? Because you're what makes us different. You go with us Jews. And God goes, okay, I'll go with you. And then Moshe goes, no, no, if you don't go with us, like, okay, I've already answered you, dude. But he, he, it's like a big, big deal to him. The rabbis say that he asked for three things in this 40-day prayer. Here we, we see that God answered one of them, that he would go with them. But you know what one of them was? That God wouldn't go with anybody else on the whole planet. 
And he'd go exclusively with the Jews. And God answered that prayer. Now that's what the rabbis say. I can prove it from scripture. I can show you because I've studied it. But I wouldn't recommend you saying that out loud to anybody. Here I am saying it on the video. But this is what this is very offensive to, to people, to believers. But the truth is that Moshe prayed, God, just be with Israel. Let us be the ones who carry this thing. And he said, okay, you and nobody else. So this is the word that you look for to figure this out. Bachar. Say Bachar. It means chosen. I have read with my own eyes on the internet where many, many, many Christian theologians, church fathers, people in the church nowadays, both Catholic and Protestant and non-denominational have said, we are the chosen people. God chose us. Okay, you can believe that if you want, but the truth is, we are, we pray it every day. Bachar Banu, he chose us from among all the nations. And that's what this is about. We're different. I'm going to say this again. If you're a Gentile and you have, like, grabbed the hold of the tzitzit of the Jew to go with the Jews, that's what you're coming into. You're coming into a group that is completely and totally different. And I've heard for 44 years Christians say, we're a peculiar people. No, you're not. You do everything like everybody else does. You eat pork. You do everything that everybody I know does. You keep Christmas, you do Christmas. What's different? You do Easter, what's different? Don't lie to me. You, you worship on Sunday, what's different? Okay, fine, you're different. Ooh, you're different. How are you different? Show me. I mean, let, let's talk, be real. The Jews are the only ones who are different, who know God. And there's a reason for it. Because God said, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to make you my people, and that's what's going to make you different. It's the only thing that makes you different. Now, he says, he uses the word niflenu, niflenu. He says, you know, uh, how, 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 how is anybody going to know we're different? How are we going to know we found grace in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that I and your people may be distinguished, different from all the people on the planet? Now the word he uses is nif, uh, the niflenu, and we are different. Now in Exodus 9.4 it uses the same verb, vahafla. Vahifla, sorry, Vahifla. And it says, and I will make a difference, a distinction, a separation between the livestock of Egypt and Israel. You can take that however you want to take it, but that's what it says. I'm going to make the Jews Niflanu from everybody else on the planet. So however you want to describe that, describe it. That's fine. But that's what it says. Niflanu. Now Numbers 23 says, I see him, this is the, the, the uh, wizard, this is the Gentile wizard, the demon worshiper, who is a very, very powerful wizard. He says, I see him from the top of the rocks and I look at him from the hills. Behold, a people that dwells apart, separately. Now when you read this in the King James and a couple other versions, it doesn't sound like this. It sounds like, ah, eh, they live in a different area. That is not what it says. <clears throat> He's prophesying. He says, a people that dwells apart and will not be counted among the Gentiles. Will not be counted among the Gentiles. And I want you to see what the rabbis say about this. Because it's not a simple thing. <clears throat> it is a nation that will dwell alone or apart. This is the legacy their forefathers gained for them to dwell apart, to dwell alone. As the Targum, Ankylos, Targum is like a working man's paraphrase of the Bible. <coughs> the Targum <coughs> renders it, it is a nation that is alone destined to inherit the world. That's pretty big, isn't it? 
A nation that is to, to dwell alone, dwell apart. Dwell alone how? They're going to rule the world. That's how they're going to dwell alone. And remember, the rabbis would have told Onkelos, you're out of your nut if you think you're going to write that, if they thought he was wrong. And then it says, and will not be reckoned among, among the nations. As Targum also says, they will not perish along with the other nations. They will not perish along with the other nations. In the birth pangs, right. For, <clears throat> then he quotes Jeremiah 30, for I shall make an end of all the nations. What do you think of that? God says I'm going to make an end of all the nations, but not Israel. And how do we know that? Because he says it in Jeremiah 33. If the sun and the moon and the stars will stop being, then maybe I'll think about getting rid of my covenant with you, Israel, and there will be no more Jewish people. It ain't going to happen. But it will happen to the rest of the nations. They will not be reckoned with the rest. Another interpretation, when they rejoice, no other nation rejoices with them. As it says, God alone will guide them to future happiness. In other words, God treats the Jews differently than he treats everybody else. And if you want to be joined to that, be joined to that. But you can't have it both ways. You can either follow that water that goes downhill into the Dead Sea and where everything dies, or you're going to struggle and go up, uphill against the current and follow the Jews, because that's where we're going. And when the nations prosper, they will receive a share with each, one, uh, with each one of them, with each one of those nations. But it will not be deducted from their account. You know what that means? It will not be deducted from the Jews' account. In other words, it's going to all come from the Gentiles. The Jews are not going to pay their tithe, not even from what they had to raise, that it will be given to them by the Gentiles and they'll give it to God as a priest of the Gentiles. That's what it's talking about. That's a whole other story. So there's some real differences here between Israel and the rest of the nations. <clears throat> now, there's a King James. It, I'll, I'll, let me start it this way. You know in the New Testament where it says, we're a peculiar people? You ever heard that phrase? We're a peculiar people. Okay, I don't see it. I see the Gentiles and Christians being exactly like everybody else in the culture. I don't see any difference whatsoever, except they believe that the Bible is God's word. Not anything else, just the Bible. Not any Jewish writings, just the Bible. So, there's that. But the truth is, they live just like the rest. You know, you know this. I'm not saying anything you don't know. That everybody in the church, Hellenized church system, lives like the rest of the culture. It's just the way it is. And they like to quote this verse in Peter that says, we're a peculiar people. Well, guess what? It doesn't say that in Hebrew, in Greek. It doesn't even say that word. What it's doing is it's quoting this word in Hebrew, segula. Segula means treasure. Say segula. segula. Means treasure. <laughs> now they, tra they mistranslate it, peculiar, to make it sound like believers are set apart and different. They are not. Israel is. And believers get to be plugged into Israel. So by association, and by association only, they get to be different. But the truth is, they're not a peculiar people. The only peculiar people are Jews, because they do this weird stuff that God said to do. Now it says in Hebrew, I'll give you one, two, three, four verses here, that say what is being quoted and what this concept is about the Jews being God's treasure, us being different. V'yitem li segula mikol ha'amin. You will be to me, li, to me, a treasure, a segula from all peoples. From all peoples, including believers. From all peoples, a tiny, tiny little subset is taken out. That's my treasure, God says. That's Israel. That's in Exodus 19 when, they, when we came to Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 14. Bahar ya. <coughs> now it doesn't say ya in Hebrew. It says Yehovah. But I ran out of space so I put ya. 
Bachar Yehova liyot la'am segula mikol ha'amim. You are chosen by Yehova, Bachar, chosen, to be a people, a treasure from all the peoples. There it is again. From all the people groups, God took one little tiny group, the Jewish people, and said, you're my treasure, because I chose you, Bachar. Now in Psalm 135, Ki Yaakov Bachar lo ya, now this does say ya, lo ya Yisrael segulato, for Jacob was chosen to himself by ya, Israel for his segula, for his treasure. This is not all the verses, this is just, a few. <clears throat> I'm keeping it short. Psalm 135.4. Oh, what is that? Oh, this is uh, Peter. I put the wrong verse. This is First, uh, first Peter. <clears throat> but you are a chosen people. Am Bachar. Am people. Bachar. Chosen. A royal priesthood. Mamlechet Kohanim. Where's that from? You sang it and said it today and read it. Exodus 19, when we came to Mount Sinai. You are a holy priesthood, a holy people, a holy nation, a treasure from all the peoples. And that's what he's quoting here. You are a royal priesthood, Mamlechet Kohanim, straight out of Exodus 19. A holy nation, Goy Kadosh, straight out of Exodus 19. A people for God's treasure, Am Segula, straight out of Exodus 19. So that you may proclaim how great he is who called you out of darkness into light. Talking to who? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Jews. And the book says he's talking to Jews. All right, so that's God choosing. Now we come to this part. <clears throat> you have, God says, you've found grace in my sight. I've known you by name. Moshe said, please show me your glory. Now I want to talk about kvod. Uh, the word for glory, if you just think of like bright shining lights like that, like light, you're going to miss what glory is. Here's how I know this. Because when I, when I was young, a young Messianic Jew, and I was in Israel, and then there were Israelis who came to our congregation off and on, this happened quite a lot, they would all say this phrase, Kol kavod Michael. I'd go, what? <laughs> That's what I would do, what? Kol kavod Joseph. And, I, and then finally I, I said, what, what are you saying to me, Kol kavod? what is that? He says, all glory to you. Oh no. No, we can't have that. We're believers. All glory unto God. And we immediately feign, you know, uh, humility and say, all glory unto God. No. It is a Jewish thing. It is a Jewish phrase and it's a Hebrew phrase. And they say it all the time in Israel. If you do something worthy of praise, which the Bible says you do, you do things that are worthy of praise, have you never read that verse? Yeah? You ever read that verse that says you do things that are worthy of praise? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So let people praise you. Kola kavod. All glory to you. Man, you worked hard. You did that good. Kola kavod. The word for kavod, glory, it means honor, respect. All respect to you, man. I mean, blacks do it all the time. Respect, man. Respect. And they get away with it. But believers, they're not allowed to say, hey, all glory to you for doing that. Because we have to give glory unto Hashem. It's absurd. Dude, give each other the respect that you deserve. If you do something great, hey, take it. Take it. I do. It took me a long time to get there, but I do. It, it, but you got to stay humble when they do it. But yeah. All respect, all glory to you when you do something good. That's what glory is. It's respect. It's not just shiny lights and, you know, like, like a cloud. It's, it's respect. It's, it's a feeling of, uh, of 
of accomplishment and wonder. It's okay. And God wants to feel that. Now, when Moshe, when, when Moshe said, show me your glory, I told you the rabbis go nuts with this. They go all over the place. They can't figure it out. But really, if you just think of it like, show me like how, how things function, how things work, and respect. Show me your respect. Show me your, your accomplishment. Show me your, your greatness. And by the way, that's what the rabbis end up saying. So, again, I'm going to say, didn't Moshe spend 40 days seeing and enveloped in God's glory? And then another 40 after that? Now, Isaiah 6 says this. I saw Jehovah sitting. Did God sit? No. Nope. On a throne. Is there a throne? Yes. No. no. No, because there's no time and space. It's all pictures. I saw Jehovah like sitting, sort of, on a, something like a throne, sort of. High. Was it high? No. no, because there's no space. There's no up and down. There's no left and right, right? With the train of his robe. Is he wearing a robe? No. There's no robe. Is there a train of the robe? No, there's no train of the robe. Filling the temple. Is there a temple? No. Nope. Yes. yes, no. <laughs> so it's all pictorial language. All of it, every bit of it. Every single word is pictorial language. Seraphim were standing above him. There's something standing above him. You know what seraphim means? Seraph, you know what seraph means? Fire, fire. good. It means fire. They're made out of fire. They're fire angels. So he sees these fire things standing above him, but they're not above him because there's no place above and below, each having six wings, with two covered his face, with two covered his feet, that means his whole body, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Kadosh, 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 Yehovah Tzvaot, Malo Kol Haaretz Kvodo. The whole earth is filled with poop. So, you believe that? The whole earth is filled with God's glory? That's crazy. People have sex with babies. But God's, oh, the whole earth is filled with his glory. So, obviously, it doesn't mean what we think it means. God's glory is filling the earth. We just don't know about it. It's Judaism. God's glory is seen in Judaism. And when God's spirit spreads that, it fills the earth. Now, this is not real. real. It's not. It's prophetic. It's going to fill the whole earth. But he, Isaiah, was taken to the time and place in which God's glory does fill the whole earth. But I mean, come on, just use your brain. God's glory does not fill the earth. God's glory is, you can't, you can't even find it. You've got to dig. and It's horrible. This world is horrible. Can you imagine the Jews in the Holocaust saying that? Because they did. During the prayers. The whole earth is filled with your glory as the Nazis spread throughout the earth. So he was taken, Isaiah was taken to a time and to a place when God's glory will fill the earth. And I'm going to show you it. Isaiah 4, 5 gives us a little hint of it. We read this at Sukkot. Jehovah will create over the entire area of Mount Zion. This is literal Mount Zion in time and space. And over her assemblies, literal assemblies, a cloud, a literal cloud by day, and smoke, and brightness of a flaming fire at night, literal night, literal fire, literal clouds, for over all the kvod there will be a chuppah. Over all the kvod, over all the glory. Now, that is going to cover at least Jerusalem and Israel, but how about the whole world? being filled with that.
Isaiah 40. Now we're going to start talking about and start getting down to the point of what is God's glory. I'm telling you this. God's glory is two things. Number one, it's Judaism. It's the pictures. It's the metaphors. Because God doesn't have a body and nothing God does has a body. Nothing's physical. It's all pictorial. And in order to, to, to know him, you do the mitzvot, you see the physical thing, and you get it. It gives you information. That's God's glory, which I will show you. <clears throat> we'll talk about the other one in a bit. Isaiah 40, the voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Now, believers immediately go to the book of John and say, oh, that's what John said. So it's talking about Yeshua, talking about Jesus as the Messiah. Yeah, it is. But no, it's way, 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 way more than that. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the uneven ground become a plain. Everything high comes down, everything low comes up and the rugged terrain, a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Will be revealed. What? So there's got to be earthquakes? Hello? There's got to be earthquakes? Like all the stuff that's high comes down, and all the stuff that's low comes up, and then God's glory will be seen. Okay, there's got to be earthquakes, right? Okay, so what he's talking about is prideful people coming down, and humble people coming up, and then God's kavod will be seen. What he's talking about is the kingdom. And that's the second part of God's glory. Number one is the pictures. Number two is the kingdom, the malchut. And he's going to say about the Jewish part here really clearly. Because <coughs> it says all flesh will see it together. Go up on a high mountain. Mevaseret Sion. Mevaseret means gospel bringer or meat bringer, like a kosher butcher. Sion is Zion. He tells Zion, who is the bearer of the gospel, to go up on a high mountain. Zion, messenger of good news, raise your voice loud, Mevaseret Yerushalayim. In case you didn't get it the first time, now he says it a second time. Mevaseret, gospel bringer, meat bringer, kosher butcher, who brings the gospel, Jerusalem. Where then is the gospel seen? Jerusalem or? What, what's the other word? Jeru Jerusalem or? Zion. That's what bears the gospel. Period. That's it. That's it. That's all that bears the gospel on this planet is Judaism. Zion, Jerusalem. The cycle of the, the Jewish year, the festivals, the sacrifices, everything in Judaism. And God tells, it, tells that group, get up on a high mountain and yell and show the gospel. And here's what you're, I want you to yell. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Where is your God? Jerusalem or Zion or in Judaism. That's the glory of God. It's the only place it's found. Except the kingdom, which is in the future. The time period that God took Isaiah to and said, you know, all these angels are in heaven saying, the whole Aretz, earth, is filled with your glory. Well, it ain't yet, but it's going to be. Isaiah 49, he said, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my kvod. So where is God's kvod? Israel, the Jews. Isaiah 66, the time is coming to gather all the Gentiles, and they will come and see my glory. What are they going to see? Jerusalem, Zion, the kingdom, Israel, Judaism. And I will do miracles among them and send survivors from them to the rest of the Gentiles that have not heard of my fame 
or seen my kavod. And they will declare my kavod among the Gentiles. Who will declare the kavod of God among the Gentiles? Whoever they is, and it looks to me like they're the Gentiles, like the other Gentiles. I'll send, he says, I'll, I'll, you know, those Gentiles, I'll get some of them and send them to the other Gentiles to declare the kavod of God. In other words, to Judaize. Gentiles being sent out to show the glory of God, which is in Judaism and in Israel and in Zion and in Jerusalem. Yes? Does that make sense? Then they, the Gentiles, will bring all your brothers from the Gentiles as a grain offering to the Lord. And I will also take some of them, the Gentiles, as priests and Levites. Just like God said in Exodus 19, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, but only because you're part of Israel. That's the glory of God. Ezekiel 39, people love to quote this one, talking about Armageddon, and God's glory comes and burns everybody up. You son of man, prophesy against Gog. Behold, I'm against you, Gog, Rosh, Magog, Meshech, Tubal, and then he lists others, there's 10 of them total. <coughs> I'll bring you against the mountains of Israel in that day. I will give Gog a burial place in Israel. So now we're in the day of the Lord, yes? No doubt about it. So they will bury Gog there and all his horde for seven months, literal months. The house of Israel will be burying them, literally burying them, in order to cleanse the land, the literal land. And it will be to them a name the day that I appear in my glory. So when's God's glory going to appear? In the birth pangs of the kingdom. And it's not going to be good. God's glory showing up is not good until it is. But it starts out bad. Isaiah 11, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Here's the kingdom again. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah said, you know, he saw all these angels saying, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzvaot, Melo Kol Haaretz Kvodo. The whole earth is filled with your glory. No, it is not. But it will be. And here's this time. He says that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Ladaat et Adonai. As the waters cover the sea. But then Havakuk at the same time prophesies the same thing and adds the glory of the Lord. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the, the knowledge of the glory. You don't need knowledge to go, oh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. What knowledge do you need to do that? Oh, I feel his glory. What knowledge do you need? So obviously, the glory of the Lord has to do with knowing God. And how do you know God? Judaism. That's where you see the glory of God. You may not feel it. But that's your problem. That's your problem if you don't feel it. I do. So obviously it exists because I can feel it. But if you don't feel it, that's your problem. You're used to feeling, ah, the glory of God is here. I can feel it. That's not the glory of God. That's emotional stuff. That has nothing to do with you getting to know God. Nothing. It's nice. Don't get me wrong. I dig it just as much as anybody else. But it's not getting to know God. <clears throat> the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the kavod et Adonai as waters cover the sea. It's going to cover the whole earth. And then the angels will be right. The whole earth is filled with your glory. Haggai 2, 7 and 9. I will shake the Gentiles, and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory. Now in this case, it's money. 
and its stuff, all kinds of treasures and things. The latter glory of this house, the temple, will be greater than the former. And in this place I will give peace. So, are you starting to get an idea of what Moshe said when he said, Show me your glory! He's not talking about a fireball. He's talking about two things. Judaism, the pictures, the shadows, and the kingdom. Now, I went a long, long, long way around to give you a simple bottom line. Guess what the rabbis do? They go, what did Moses ask for? All the things about God that we can understand and the day of the Lord. That's all I had to do. But you wouldn't understand what they're saying. <laughs> right. John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only one from the Father. So, he was the Torah walking around. That was the glory. Judaism. He was, right, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Judaism. <clears throat> Judaism walking around. That's the glory. It's not long-haired, you know, gentle little man saying, Oh, come forth and I shall walk upon the water and I shall come unto thee. Be thou healed. That's not glory. That's ridiculous. The glory was that he was a Jew and he was Judaism in the flesh. That's glory. I don't even know what that means. And I've been studying this for 40 years. I still don't even know what it means. I can't picture it in my head that Yeshua opened his mouth and Judaism came out. Every word was Judaism. Every act was Judaism. I can't even picture it because of all the nonsense that's been shown to us. The pictures and the movies and all that just completely destroyed it. But that's the glory of God. Romans 8, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the resurrection here. That our body will reflect our Jewish soul in the resurrection. That's what he's talking about here, Romans chapter 8. The glory... It, uh, the, the present time we go through all this stuff, oh well, it's nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us, in our bodies. Because we're going to be doing Judaism unhindered. Let me put it to you this way. Think of the thing that's unkosher that you love to eat. You just love it. I mean, like, you can't, you can't hardly walk past the table and not go... Mm. that's a pretty good example because it covers everybody now think about the thing you like that's not kosher for me it's breakfast sausage because my dad used to always make breakfast sausage every morning and I love the way it made the house smell and I'd say dad, dad can I have some and he'd say yeah, come here Mike and he'd give me some sausage I loved it I loved everything about it <laughs> can you imagine being able to be grossed out I, I mean it's, it's hard for me it's hard for me to imagine being grossed out by that breakfast sausage it's hard for me to do that but the Torah says to do that right you shall be disgusted by it that's an act of your will oh god that's disgusting and really feel it, in our resurrected body, you're going to be able to do that. I mean, it, any, any, any sin, any sin that you have a hard time you know, like getting away from, we're going to have a body that reflects Judaism. That's not going to be hard to do it. It'll be easy. That's what he's talking about here. The glory that it will be revealed in us, the kavod, that's revealed in us. In other words, the Judaism that's revealed in us. Romans 9, who are, now here's, here's, this one's amazing. Who are Israelites to whom belongs the glory? It's that simple. Who does the glory belong to? The Jews. Because that's who God gave it to. God gave the Jews the, the glory, the kavod. Pretty simple. 2 Corinthians 3. Now this one's really, really hard to understand. 
So I don't want to spend much time on it. I've trimmed it down, way down, because I don't want to get into it because you probably don't even have enough to wade through these words to understand what it's talking about. So I'll just do a little bit. When God gave the Torah, he gave two Torahs. He gave the Torah of life, which is the pictures, the shadows. And he also gave along with it the dot, the curse of the law. That's in Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. Yeah? And that's at Mount Sinai. He gave two Torahs. He didn't just give one. He gave the Torah of life, the pictures. And along with it, he gave the Torah of death, the curse of the law. And that's what he's talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But if the ministry of death, that's the curse of the law, engraved in letters on stones, came with glory. Even the dot came with kavod, with glory. Why? Because that's going to exist in the kingdom. That's how we're going to judge. Now, we're not going to be judged by it. But the birth pangs are all about the world being judged by it. So even that came with kavod. Then the ministry of the Ruach can't fail to have even more glory. For indeed that, would ha that which had glory, the curse of the Torah, in this case has no glory by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. So don't think that the glory is just the pictures in the Torah. The curse of the law, the dot of the law, also has glory associated with it. It's the judgment that God is going to use to judge in the birth pangs. But that's all. That's all it's for. So I'm trying to make that as simple as I can. Now, Proverbs 25, bottom line. It is the glory of God to hide stuff. And it is the glory of kings to search it out. That's God's glory, the pictures. Moshe says, God, I've been, I've been wrapped in your, you know, your, my, your, the, the heroin. I need a fix. I need to be enwrapped with you again. You know, and I want to be all over you and you all over me. I want that. I want it. You've been showing me everything about you. And now I've got to be down here with these jerk people. Oh, come on. Give me more. Show me your glory. And it's two things. It's the pictures. It's what they're a picture of. The real stuff. The pictures are the glory. And the only people who get that is the people who have the Spirit of God. And the second thing is the day of the Lord. It's the kingdom. But you got to go search it out to see it. Did, did God say, okay, I will show you my glory? No. no. He said, I'm going to stick you in a hole. I'm going to pass by you, so to speak. I'm going to cover you with my hand, so to speak, and then you're going to see my backside, so to speak, and I'm going to talk about who I am. Adonai, Adonai, el rachom v'chanun erech apayim, v'rav chesed ve'emet notzer la'alafim. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, compassionate, abounding in loving kindness, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. That's... What I sh that's what he showed Moses. He didn't show him his glory. He didn't. The glory is the kingdom. And by the way, he got to see the kingdom, didn't he? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We know he did. Because we've seen it over and over and over and over. And he's the one who's shown the pictures. So, what was there to show him? He'd already had it. He'd already gotten it. He'd already seen the pictures, and he gave them to Bezalel, and he'd already seen the kingdom. So the rest is just, uh, get up and go lead them to Israel already. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. God gives, that's exactly right. God gives all the puzzle pieces, and then we have to, we have to. I know that scares you as Christians, I get it. We have to assemble the pieces properly. 
And you can't, you can't just go, oh, Holy Spirit, show me. It doesn't work that way. You gotta do the work because it's the glory, it's the glory of kings to search out, not lay back and beg for help. Search out, do the work so that God can say to you, here it comes, kola kavod, all glory to you. You did it, all glory, kola kavod. I would really like to start using that phrase. When somebody does something that's worthy of praise, praise them. Don't be so, so hard and arrogant and, and, uh, and mean. Praise people for what they do that's good. You know, like, like I said, black people do it all the time. Respect, man, respect. And they say, give them their props, their propers. That's what that is. It's respect. Kol kavod, all glory to you. Good job. Give credit where credit's due. Kol kavod. So you're going to have to do the work if you're going to get that, that kavod from God. If you want to see his kavod. Let's pray. Abba, thank you for showing us your kavod, your glory, in the pictures and in the kingdom. I ask that you tie us to the kingdom. And I, I ask, Father God, that your Ruach HaKodesh would open the doors. You know, we, we don't get to see anything that Moshe saw, but I said you'd show us a little tiny bit of it. A little tiny bit of all that amazing stuff that's real. I ask that you'd show us your way, your derech, so that we can keep your way, so we can know you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Let's stand for the Aleinu. Aleinu. Aleinu la shabeach la adon Let's get a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of Let us adore the Lord of all who in greatness created the world from of old, that he has not made us like the nations of the earth, not made us like the families of the land. He's not made our destiny like theirs or cast our lot with all of them. Let's do Kiddush. <laughs>